All right, guys. And just like that, we are back again with the Mind the Growth podcast. As always, I am Chris Kinghorn. And I'm Eric Hoffman. All right. And today we have the product master, former CTO, and just overall awesome guy, Gabe Weiss. Gabe, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on, guys. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, do you mind telling us who you are, telling the world who you are, uh, maybe sharing a little bit of your, your past history? Um, we'd love to love to start diving in. Yep. Yeah. Like you mentioned, I'm Gabe. I have um, a technology and product background. Um, and so I've been working in the startup space in Arizona for close to four years now, I think. Um, I originally graduated ASU with a computer science degree. And um, right after I graduated, um, I kind of got pulled into a really early stage um, at the time, um, logistics startup called Holinx, which, um, you know, originally just started their um, coding their mobile app. And I'm um, just doing some like low level engineering stuff. And as the team grew, I took on more management responsibilities. We started scaling the team and um, I eventually became, you know, responsible for the entire engineering team and got appointed CTO and uh, was CTO through an acquisition that we had um, with a publicly traded trucking company was a part of that team kind of post acquisition as the company transitioned into that enterprise for about another, I want to say year ish, um, something like that. And then got kicked out of that, that company and kind of floated around for a little bit, doing some, doing some like side consulting, figure out what I wanted to do next. And then eventually ended up joining up with Uplink, uh, recently, which is, I'm um, still kind of, um, you know, throughout that whole time period, I kind of transitioned from engineering more into product and design oriented work. Um, so originally at, at Hollings, the two were combined together. Like we didn't really understand like how to build like uh, kind of like a proper product and design team. And then, you know, post acquisition with, um, with Hollings got more heavily involved with that and, and learned really kind of what all that stuff meant. And that's what I'm doing now with Uplink. It's, it's pure product and design, uh, but I still leverage a lot of that engineering background. Um, to be able to kind of bridge the gap between, you know, business, product, and, uh, and technology. So computer science degree from ASU, how did that fall into place? Did you, were you always tinkering around engineering as a kid? Or was that yeah. something that just kind of popped up and fit? Yeah, that's a great question. It goes way back to when I was like a small kid. So my dad was an electrical engineer. And mm -hmm. so just growing up, we were always talking about science and engineering and, and technology like i was like a proper nerd as a kid like a really how things kid. work yeah, yeah. <laughs> was obsessed with all that was always taking shit apart and um and got into like electronics and um like home built computers like really young as well and so it's kind of always a part of my life um i think you know during during kind of like my high school like teenage years kind of moved away from it a little bit and wasn't necessarily sure what I wanted to do kind of going into career wise. And so when I originally um, went into college, like I just went in undeclared, just kind of general ASU has this like general engineering degree where they just start giving you math classes and see if you'll figure out what's up. And, I thought uh, you were going to say they just start handing out beer bongs and uh, things of that nature. I think those are the classes <laughs> that I was in. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we might have been the engineering and the business side might have been. And it shows, different. Chris, it shows. <laughs> Made it here. Yeah. I think that's a little bit more the business side. Um, also, where did you grow up in Arizona or did you grow up elsewhere? So I've been in Arizona for about 12 years now. I moved here at the very beginning of my freshman year of high school. So I originally gotcha. grew up as a, as a kid in Wisconsin. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. And where'd you go to high school? I went to high school, a small private school down in Chandler. Okay. It's called Tri, I think it's Tri City Christian. Tri City cool. Christian High School. My graduating class was like 20 people. Oh, wow. But that Mine is actually like where I met. A thousand. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Dude, yeah. that's the classic like Arizona public school. Did you did you I grow know. up here? Yeah, yeah. I grew up, spent yep. most of my life here. 100%. Yep. yep. But one of the, the interesting things that thousand. came out of that. Oh, sorry. What's up? Uh, mine was about the same as a thousand. So yeah. Yeah. One of the interesting things that came out of that high school experience, despite how tiny the class size was, um, we had a number of like interesting kids in there. I met Alex there as well. Uh, so we graduated together. Um, and now we've been involved with two startups. So that's kind of cool. Very cool. I, I find that uh, fairly often with startups and 
friends that have stuck together for a while that they just yeah. kind of follow each other throughout different businesses. I think that's great. Gabe, so kind of shifting back to a few quick questions about the uh, the acquisition, or not necessarily the acquisition, but the the, the previous company. Um, mm -hmm. You had mentioned that you were essentially the first engineer on the team, right? Yeah, that's not. So I was technically the second or third, I believe. There were a couple guys that were they had full time jobs, and then they worked on Hollings uh, part time. Okay. So I basically joined um, Hollings right after they raised their first um, round of seed funding, and they were looking to get their first full-time engineering. Um, so I was kind of like formally designated like employee number one. Um, yeah. So that was, it was neat to be there at the very beginning. But yeah, there were a couple other tech guys that had um, kind of laid the initial foundation for the prototype that they were, um, that they were starting to try to go to market with. Okay. When, and when it was acquired, how many people were on the, were on the engineering team? I think it was around 40. Okay. So we scaled so quite a bit between, I think I joined mid 2018. And okay. we were acquired formally in the middle of 2020, but we had already like sealed the partnership agreement that kind of went into the acquisition, everything like that late 19. So in a year and a half, we went from me to like 40 people um, just within the, the tech org. So that was a pretty, I mean, for the, just being super green at managing engineering and, and doing technology work in general, like fresh grad trying to deal with that level of scaling was, it was pretty wild. Yeah. What so, was that process like? Yeah, and uh, a second part to the question is with that scaling, did you get assistance or guidance from any of the investors that you guys had or was it really just a, a, as a need to need basis? Yeah, so none of the other none of the investors in Hollings really had much of a technology background. A few of them, maybe one or two of them had been involved with other technology companies in the past, but there weren't really, I think the only help we got from them was maybe a lead on a good like overseas development team that helped kind of plug the gaps while we were still trying to grow um, our local dev team. So we were pretty much, I mean, like we just had to figure it out just from scratch, starting from nothing, understand like how to architect modern like multi-platform apps. And we also started running into big data challenges because, you know, the whole, like the whole premise of the Hollings product is we had a physical hardware device that we had to configure ourselves and um, outsource the production of plugged into trucks. And those devices produce an obscene amount of data on a daily basis because they're constantly pulling telematics parameters out of the engines as those trucks drive. And so as like super junior engineers, we had to, we started to have to deal with like these big data challenges that nobody, nobody on the team was really qualified to deal with. We managed to hack it together, but it, it was like, it was, it was very dicey. So was the business model to sell the product or manage the data? How, how did that work with all links? Cause I'm not too familiar to be honest. Yeah. yeah. So it was a little bit of, it was a little bit of a unique situation. All the other competitors in the space of what we were trying to do, which is started out just compliance monitoring you the the federal government makes truck drivers who drive long haul like across the country and stuff like that they have to have a hardware device keeping track mm -hmm. of the truck otherwise they're going to cheat on their logs all the time drive way more hours than they're supposed to so we were one of a field of devices that offered that compliance service but the way that we approached it from a go-to-market strategy was a little bit unique. We gave away the device. We gave away the software to the truckers in the hopes that we would eventually gather enough data about the patterns that truck drivers take as they're moving around the country and be able to put that into a marketplace concept where freight brokers and other freight suppliers could come in on the other side and uh, leverage the, the data piped through machine learning system and be able to target loads directly at the truckers that would be a best fit for those loads. So was, we were hoping to kind of create this win-win between truckers and, and freight suppliers to, to match the, the loads that are best for them. So I, the, the company that I'm familiar in the space is, uh, I think it's called Flexport. They're a freight forward technology company. Yeah, yeah. And you may be familiar with them. So is a group a little, like yeah, that- Yeah, a little bit. Is a group like that a company that would essentially buy your data to analyze it and you know package it to other shipping companies is that kind yeah. of the ecosystem that you're describing yeah 
they could theoretically, and it's been a long time. Like I've been out of the space for more than a year at this point. Yeah. yeah. And Flexport did not well, is really. That, is that why everything's going to shit? Because you're out of the space? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. With Gabe no left. There, like, everything's haywire. Do? I know. Seriously. <laughs> the supply chain's totally screwed. And yeah. It's all Gabe's fault. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, Go so on. they didn't. I interrupted. Yeah, no, you're good. The um, flexport freight forwarding is a little like it's a tangential use case in logistics. Mm-hmm. We ended up not really touching um, a whole lot of their model, and I'm not super familiar with them as a result. Gotcha. So I don't know if it would necessarily apply um, in that particular case. But if you were any, if you were any company basically who needed to move freight at scale. And that freight needed to go on trucks as opposed to like rail or like air freight or something like that. We could have theoretically, you could have been a part of that marketplace to find small like mom and pop truckers to, to take that freight efficiently. Got so it. that could have applied. I'm not sure. So Gabe, uh, kind of touching on the acquisition, cause that, that, that was some interesting clarity on the, on the transition period. But do you think that the product progressed in the way that you were hoping it would? You know, obviously being part of a product from its inception or very, you know, the very beginning, did did the way it ended up, was that the direction that you saw it going? Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. And like, looking back on it, I'm honestly not like, I have mixed feelings about how it, how it ended up in the direction that it took, because in, you know, like information, I only get like bits and pieces of where the, the product has developed now but from what i can tell they have continued to try to fulfill a large amount of the initial vision although i think the most novel piece of using machine learning to really understand the patterns of freight movement to drive more efficiency in that marketplace i don't think they've really fulfilled that necessarily but it is a two-sided marketplace there are devices that continue to go out into the field and um and freight is being moved on those lanes where we have devices so i think a large portion of the vision it's it's at least carried on pretty well you know given that you know acquisitions are super unpredictable like the acquiring company can kind of do whatever they want and so sometimes projects get mothballed or taken in a totally different direction by comparison with that honestly it has kind of stayed pretty true to the original vision the challenge with it is like We, at the time when we started Hollinx, did not fundamentally understand the scale of what we were proposing to build. And so it was just such a massive, a massive undertaking that, you know, even today with the additional resources that the, that the acquiring company has put behind it, they're still only maybe a halfway there in terms of what we were originally envisioning, I think. And when you were getting acquired, was that when you... When you came on board as quote unquote employee number one, uh, do you know was the plan to always get acquired or did this just come out of the blue and it seemed to be a fit and it was a good win for everyone? How did that uh, go from start to finish? Yeah, when I originally joined, um, I don't think the plan was necessarily to focus in particular on getting acquired. Obviously you wanna have some type of successful exit, right? Yeah. But, um, and I think for a lot of companies, unless you're going to go all the way to like an IPO or something like that, like getting acquired probably is one of the best ways to exit. Getting acquired that soon within, you know, 18 to, to 24 months of when um, the initial round of seed funding dropped, that was kind of unexpected. We, we had a couple, we had a couple interesting features that we released and were able to get like some small amount of like industry news coverage on and um that are that eventually opened up the door to having conversations with the with the enterprise that came in um Mm -hmm. that that happened way earlier in the game than we were kind of expecting we were we thought we were gonna have to do like several more rounds of fundraising before the concept was i think mature enough um, to potentially be looking at that, but it did just kind of pop up out of nowhere. And it was a good fit with, you know, where we are at in terms of fundraising. Um, and so we just kind of went with it. Gotcha. And, and partly why I ask is because when I think about tech companies starting off, you, you either take the path of growing data and users or growing revenue. Obviously in your case, that was the whole point is to grow data, uh, yep. by giving the, the product out for free. And right. so in that 
path, I oftentimes see the end goal being just a, a quicker acquisition than if you were mm-hmm. to try to grow your revenue as much as possible. That takes time. So that yeah, that's, exactly. that helps me understand a little bit better. Yeah, and in so, hindsight, it fits that model perfectly. We just didn't yeah, know. We yeah. weren't planning on it, but it totally sure. ended up working out that way. Yeah. So on the uh, on the on the previous data play, and now it seems like a, a new data play. <laughs> uh, can you give us uh, some context on what you're working on now, and you know what your role is in the company? Yeah, yeah. So I just recently joined a fintech startup, also based in Arizona, called Uplink. Um, I think you guys have have done a session with a couple of the Uplink co-founders, Alex and Ethan. And so you guys got to kind of hear like their side of uh, the experience of kind of starting that. I came in like way later into the project. So I'm now I'm the director of the technology product that we have. Um, and so my focus is building out all of the um, all of the web based experience that our um, our clients interact with, um, which is that's probably like half maybe of what the what the total like uplink vision is so there's a couple different pieces to it you know originally it was kind of envisioned also as like a two-sided marketplace um, type situation where instead of leveraging like logistics source data like we were with truckers it was going to leverage um kind of source financial data from small businesses in particular startups um to kind of understand at a much more granular level than you typically would have access to current state you know what the health of the business is um, almost in real time and then be able to transform that into a marketplace that investors could come into um, and find um, find companies that were that were um, good to invest in. That's pivoted a little bit, um, and we're focused um, almost you know really narrowly just on the aspect of ingesting the data um, from these small businesses and startups and being able to categorize it correctly, so we can power some of that financial intelligence. Um, that would be that would um, sort of enable like the long term concept. Um, and so, you know, once we started to focus in particularly on that categorization aspect, that that falls into the realm of bookkeeping, what is traditionally known as bookkeeping kind of within the accounting space. And so we sort of narrowed our vision down just to that, to be able to go into small businesses, ingest their data quickly and get up and running to deliver um, a high quality books, bookkeeping service at a lower cost and with much less involvement from these businesses than they would typically be used to if they were using like a traditional bookkeeper and then be able to take the insights that we've gathered on top of that categorized financial data and be able to turn that back around for the small business and offer really powerful um, financial intelligence so that they can understand the health of their own business um, to a deeper level than they maybe are today. And is, uh, is the tech play more of like a machine learning type of technology that you're leveraging to, I guess, organize this data? Or how, from a technology perspective, are you uh, taking on that task? Yeah, absolutely. So the machine learning aspect um, comes into play um, at the categorization level. That's the most foundational piece um, to the actual technology concept behind it. So current state, although different companies claim to be working on it, Mm -hmm. current state, if you want bookkeeping done, for your business, it has to be done at least primarily by hand. Computers just don't understand where transactions come from, where they're supposed to go to, how they're supposed to be categorized well enough for that process to be completely automated. So on the technology side in particular, we're hoping to make significant gains in that in that specific area to enable an even greater level of efficiency when it comes to being able to deliver bookkeeping and financial intelligence. So that part of the tech stack will be essentially proprietary to Uplink? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, has there been any discussion of uh, just leveraging that piece of technology or licensing it, it out to other companies, groups, et cetera? Or is it really just focused on building the product for small businesses? I would say mostly the latter. Um, okay. And since it's at such an early stage, I mean, we've considered a lot of different possibilities, but we want to wait and see how it develops and, and see what the potential is before we would probably want to pursue any of those specific angles. So I want to I want to dumb it down as much as possible too, just so that somebody listening fully understand kind of what it is you guys do. So yeah. and correct me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding is you have a variety of inputs and outputs that come through that are involved in a company, whether that's payroll, that's money coming in, whether it's through Stripe, you're keeping track of things through QuickBooks, et cetera. 
you guys essentially have a centralized location where all of that data is inputted and you have an output with the standardized financial statement that is accurate and can't be falsified, kind of going back to the value proposition on the investor side of this is true, this is accurate, this is everything that, that we that we legitimately do. That's right. Yep. Okay. Per that's a, yeah. I think that's a great summary. Yeah. I just try to do high level. Chris, Chris is Chris is looking for a new job in case you need <laughs> someone on the product development side or the marketing side. You no, know. I'm not. I am <laughs> I'm going strong, baby. Yeah. Um, awesome. So I guess with that, Gabe, um, looking at the your experience at at Hollinx, um, yeah. How have you? What have you taken from that experience, and how are you applying that now at Uplink? Yeah, it's that's a super it's a super deep question because obviously, I mean, you want to take every piece of that experience and, and try to find the lessons in it, um, whether it's positive or negative, and make it work at Uplink. You know, I think one of the most you know one of the most profound insights that I feel like kind of gathered in the course of scaling the team at Hollinks and you know kind of going through the acquisition process is just kind of an approach to how you think about like what what the right like who the right people are to bring into the team at each stage and it's honestly been you know almost taking a little bit more cynical view of who should be building technology products and um, I think you know one of the things that I've that I realized more painfully than not honestly is it's sometimes it's better to spend more on a smaller group of more talented more experienced people than it is to just get as many people that can kind of do the job as possible into the team all at once but I feel like that's probably the single biggest most impactful insight that I've kind of tried to carry over into into my approach for resourcing at, uh, at Uplink. How hard is that in a place like Phoenix or Tempe in particular, in your case, versus, you know, the tried and true Silicon Valley, where that's the actual value proposition is that's where yeah. all of the talented engineers are. How, how, how hard has that been both with Hall Links and now Uplink to get yeah. those people you describe? Yeah. So, I mean, my entire team right now is remote. So that should tell you enough just yeah. in and of itself <laughs> at Hollings, We went super heavy local. And honestly, like okay. I'm really proud of what we were able to do. Like, I feel like we honestly sucked in some of the most talented, hardest working engineers in the, in the local Tempe Gilbert Phoenix area. And we, I would, I'm super proud of the team that we had developed at Hollings. you know, before we, before we went into the acquisition. But at the same time, it was really, really hard to find the kind of people that you need to build a technology product at that scale just within the local market. I think it's gonna be interesting to watch um, for a change in the talent pool in Arizona as people begin to move out of some of the more legacy high technology areas like Silicon Valley or California in general, but also you know from other parts like Denver, Boulder area and, and Seattle and things like that, I think you're going to continue to see um, an influx of talent into Phoenix. But I would say, unfortunately, like the current state is a lot of the time it's, you know, if, if anyone wanted to build like a high technology concept company in the Phoenix area, it's going to be tough to source the people that you need for that. And that's just like the honest assessment that, that I have from, from the experience that I've been through so far. Gotcha. And with, with Uplink specifically, is it too early right now to have some major like KPIs or goals in place? Or do you guys have something in mind to measure success on an early stage? Yeah, so there's different levels of measurement that we want to try and get to. Um, if you're kind of talking about like the business as a whole, I think that's mm -hmm. a little bit distinct from just measuring the product by itself. And so, you know, from a holistic business perspective, no, I don't think it's too early at all to have KPIs that we want to strive for. And those are all kind of around revenue and number of users that we want to see and the kind of user growth rate that we want to see as we go through you know, 2022 going into 23 and how efficient we want our sales pipeline to be. Those are all super relevant right now at this early stage. I think with the product in the state that it's in, it's a little bit different. And I'm, I'm kind of waiting for it to develop 
and mature a little bit more and become a little bit more all encompassing. You know, normally I think product people are taught to lean super heavily into uh, metrics and KPIs really, really early on. I think that's the right call almost all the time, but there are situations and I think we're in one of them where it's kind of too early to be measuring meaningful engagement for the product, just the way that our engagement model works at the moment. And that's okay. Like as we develop it, further and expand what it can do and expand the value that it gives back to the user, we'll be able to see those gains quantitatively, but at the moment, not necessarily. So what would your definition of a successful product look like? I mean, maybe give us your de definition of a successful product for Uplink and then just as a whole. I mean, when you think yeah. of a successful product, what does mm -hmm. that look like to you? Yeah. Yeah. The highest aim that I have in for the short to midterm at Uplink is to be able to deliver insights about a small business's finances that they have not had access to, access to previously. Now that's that's what I think about like, almost every day. It's, you know, I've gotten to see this now with two companies and, you know, a variety of other like friends and acquaintances who have had businesses and stuff like that. It's super time consuming to go through the data that you have access to in your business, aggregate it, condense it all down, get it into a nice looking format, and then go do like analysis and data visualization on top of that. like. Small business owners don't have time for that. They just don't, like hardly anybody does. At large enterprises, that's a whole team of people um, just doing like internal business intelligence. It's really, really time consuming. And so if we could accomplish like one thing in kind of that near to midterm, it would be to automatically do that for these small businesses and present back their own financial metrics to them in a way that they've never seen before and improve the health of their business just by the fact that they have access to that now. So uh, with your engineering team that you're building at Uplink, let's focus on them for a second. Uh, they're remote. Great. That's, that's the way of the world these days. What skill sets are you looking for? Are you looking for specific programming language, a specific type of design protocol? You know, what, what are you looking for in an engineer when you're bringing them on specifically for Uplink? Yeah. So, yeah. So just to clarify, like, I'm only doing, I'm only doing like the product and design stuff now. So my product and design team is completely remote on the engineering side. We have been able to um, find a few um, local developers um, through like personal connections and stuff like that, that, that are also really, really amazing. And so, but I think, um, I think overall, like if you were looking at any, any type of like technical contributor and I'll, I'll focus in more on like designers cause that's primarily what I, what I deal with now um, most frequently, but you kind of want to see two things of really strong lead. There has to be, there has to be like a natural talent and intuition for doing that type of work present. It's really hard to tell if that's true, but like when it's there, you know, it's there. And then you also want to combine that with experience. And so finding that sweet spot, um, where somebody is both talented and experienced, really hard to do. You're getting close to like the top, you know, five to 10% of the market in those, those different disciplines. But if you want to build a technology product, I think just really across the board, um, not just at Uplink, but just in general, um, I think that's really, it's a really good goal to try and be sourcing talent in that, in that top tier um, if you want to progress efficiently. And from a design perspective, because that's, as you mentioned, what you're focusing on, I've been curious and I've been seeing a lot lately that web design in general is becoming pretty commoditized across the internet. And there's lots of groups, even one in Arizona you may be familiar with that I've used, Design Pickle, and others that you basically sign up for a membership, get free access to web design uh, for your business or whatever you're doing. So what are your feelings on those types of businesses, it can design be commoditized to your acceptable level? <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, it's, you know, to answer it properly, I feel like it's important to draw a distinction between what people would consider like traditional web design and mm -hmm. then what I have to deal with, which is UX UI design. So in terms of, uh, and also like graphic design, right? Like if you were gonna go out and build like a high quality website, I think that's pretty commoditized. Um, maybe not at like the absolute high end, like the top, like 5% of websites that's still, you know, there are designers building custom sites that command super high prices for, for doing that work. But I think 
um, at any tiers below that, that that's pretty well commoditized and even more so on like the graphic design side, like logos and like um, illustrations and stuff like that you would typically see in like a marketing or, like business site that is really commoditized and the market for it is just enormous. But what I deal with most frequently in the product space is, is user experience and user interface design. And I think that that industry and set of disciplines as a whole, you're just now seeing the beginning of a massive spike in the need for UX talent. Um, so that's far from being commoditized. It's on like that upward curve where it's, I mean, it's, it's so hard to envision like an entire app with all of the different flows built out that you need to transition people from screen to screen and deal with things um, when when errors pop up, um, especially if the app itself is kind of novel. Like there's a lot of best practices in the space for sure, but it's just such a it's such a multifaceted dynamic challenge. It's really really difficult to find high quality UX designers, and I would say it's very very far from being commoditized. Farther than software engineering, software engineering will be commoditized before UX design and, and automated with uh, our friend gpt3 <laughs> no it's uh, it's true though yeah. i don't i don't think people realize how much time and effort goes into it and gabe not to try to take the stage away from you but when we yeah. were first building our application you know there was there was hundreds of pages of 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 each screen each button everything is is thought through mm -hmm. we would whiteboard for hours of you know does the checkbox go on the bottom left or does it go on the bottom right where's your thumb going to be how are you holding this if it's yeah. in a tablet versus a phone, what happens if you turn the screen? So there's so many just additional yeah. variables where it has to have some sort of human element kind of with the, uh, with the input as well. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it'll ever be fully automated because there's so many, there's an infinite, there's an infinite amount of, of use cases um, of what an app can be used for. So, yeah, it's going to be, you know, I, mean, I think that's like a really profound open challenge for more powerful AI in the next, I don't know, let's say 30 years or something. Give it like 30, 40 years, see where AI is at. Maybe artificial, artificial intelligence can actually like go design a whole app for you. That would be pretty amazing, but I, but it's theoretically possible, right? Like games in AI have been enormous over the last two decades. Like there's no reason to believe that it can't continue like that. But yeah, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, part of what's affected the UX industry as a whole is like, it's almost like an arms race in design where if you backtrack like, two decades where web apps were just starting to become a thing and mobile apps didn't exist yet, really, um, for the most part, like pre-iPhone, pre-Android. Design was more solidly in that like web design, like graphic design space, and people were just throwing up shit all over the place. Like you could get away with almost anything in terms of like design quality. And UX had never been even like conceptualized or articulated at all as an idea in and of itself. As UX started to develop out of like graphic design and digital design and, and web design and stuff like that. Businesses started to realize that design quality was a shortcut to establishing trust with the customer. And as soon as major businesses started to key into that idea, all of a sudden you started to see this massive ramp up in the overall user experience quality that you would even need to hit at like a minimum level to be somewhere meaningful on like the app store or something like that. So now like if you want to start um, a software product from scratch, either on the web or on mobile phones, UX design is a really significant amount of the overall like tech budget that you'd have to allocate in order to even achieve the minimum quality standard that people just expect from everyday products that they're, that they're used to using. Otherwise you're going to stand out. Right. It's like a house with, like no doors and windows on it. Like nobody ever buy that, right? Like it just, it just looks weird. If you see design done by amateurs sitting alongside like professionally designed apps. And I think you're going to see that continue. Like I said, I think we're on, we're only like halfway up the, the spike in the UX market right now. I just envision like a 2004 Blackberry and trying to use the text message function when I was a kid back in the day when <laughs> <laughs> what the user experiences are are now versus that. What, but putting an uplink and your current role aside, what businesses or apps or 
anything you can think of excite you right now? And what, what could you envision yourself doing if Uplink weren't your mm. next move? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, it's hard to disconnect it from Uplink because Uplink introduced me to the fintech space. I don't have a mm -hmm. finance background. Like I was never like a money person or a business person growing up or, or educationally or anything like that. But going into fintech brand new has, you know, it's really been an interesting world to learning about how financial data is passed, you know, between different institutions and and all of the infrastructure that, that goes along with that. It's super fascinating. And just even learning about like the investment space, like I didn't know, I, mean, I didn't know shit about stocks like two years ago or crypto like two or three years ago um, or basically, you know, even like investments that that investment categories that people would consider like super commonplace today. Like I didn't know anything about it. It just wasn't it just wasn't in my like field of view at all. And so I think that's been one of like the coolest things about getting into that space a little bit and kind of dipping my toes in those different areas. And so it'd be fascinating to work on other types of fintech products, uh, maybe something a little bit more consumer oriented and um, at the same time, I think the emerging technology that, that excites me the most and has for several, several years is probably augmented reality. Um, you know, we've had like a huge growth in VR technology over the last decade to where now like VR systems are pretty mature. Um, but at the same time, like use cases for VR are kind of limited. It's hard to go beyond gaming with that. But when whoever makes a breakthrough in the hardware that you need for augmented reality, within 10 years of that moment, like you're going to see the way that you interact with computers, like completely change. It's going to be like a night and day difference, I think, from the way that we currently think about interacting with desktops and phones. And I, you know, I'm not super worried about it right now because it's like, it's really, really early. But at the same time, if I, if I wasn't doing something with Uplink, I would probably be trying to get in at the ground floor of of some company doing something really meaningful in the augmented reality space probably have you identified anyone doing anything There's, interesting it's tough because the only companies that really honestly have like any business um, making leaps in that space right now are big companies like facebook like obviously facebook just rebranded to meta and they're going to lean super hard into that over the next like 10 to 20 years um, apple's probably going to bet super big on it google's Google's done random projects with it. The issue right yeah. now with the AR space is that it just takes so much money, so much money to make any meaningful progress because there's big hardware barriers that you have to get across before you could see a consumer product that's good and useful. So I think that um, the hardware challenge probably has to be solved with some institution with a massive amount of capital. Once that happens though, and you can start to democratize that technology and you get you know whatever the, whatever like the iPhone of AR is, and the focus transitions back into app development, then you'll see this whole like, um, like revolution of, of new applications being built for that stack, similar to kind of the, the boom of apps that happened after the iPhones app store was opened up to the public. There's going to be another right. one of those for AR. So that's, that's, I think, more where, more where the real game is going to be. In your view, so does of... the, do, sorry, Chris, one last question. In your view, does the hardware have to essentially be uh, something on your face to accomplish yeah. that? Yeah, it does. It yeah. does, for sure. You could you can play around with the tech. Yeah. You can get like a vision for what it's supposed to be using some of the like the phone based AR, but mm -hmm. just nothing close to like what we're gonna eventually need to see to get widespread traction in the consumer space. Like a Google Glasses concept. Yeah. Yeah. But like, so, but like 10x off of that. Yeah, right. exactly. So staying yeah. within the, uh, I guess we'll call it the metaverse for now. What, do you, what are your thoughts on blockchain technology as a whole? You know, Web3 obviously being intimately involved in the engineering space. I mean, how do you, yeah. how do you see them shaping the future of development and, and how businesses, businesses are essentially ran? Dude, it's gonna be, it's it's gonna be interesting to see how that develops. I mean, to a certain extent, you can already say that like like cryptos, crypto made it, like it exists today. There are mature currencies. There's mature exchanges. You can buy all kinds of random shit with with cryptocurrency, and I don't think anybody really, very very tiny amount of people imagine that being possible like a decade ago. So to a certain extent, like that milestone within the overall, I guess you could say like Web three ecosystem that's been achieved like we're kind of there 
that's really amazing. At the same time, the, I guess if you were to say like, what percentage of the overall general population is really touched by blockchain technology, by Web3 in general, it's probably really small. Probably really small and you kind of have to be pretty savvy with the tech behind it and the concepts behind it in order to kind of play in that space right now. I think that there is a lot there's a lot of breakthroughs that still have to happen in the web three ecosystem before you can see like a lot of mass adoption that like changes the way that we do something. Like maybe it'll change the way that we do banking or or like mortgages or credit cards or something like that or something that nobody's ever heard of before like nfts like nfts super breakthrough right but at the same time like the tech is so complex and the concepts that make web3 possible are really really technical like try explaining blockchain to some random person (laughs) like half the people doing the explaining don't understand how it works we've tried so (laughs) right i'm sure you have like yeah i've tried too It it doesn't like it's so tough. It's so tough to wrap your head around, which makes it really exciting. But also, like, it's it's kind of unpredictable when the next um, when the next milestone in that in that space will happen. I think it's a little pre- like I think the idea of Web three is a little pretentious. Like, do you think it's inevitable that it will break through and, and that will be the future, or do you think that there's maybe some thresholds that are going to be too difficult to break through? Yeah. So, it you know. I was reading an article maybe like two or three weeks ago, a developer doing like a walkthrough of how he was coding like a decentralized app. And then he did an example with, with NFTs on OpenSea and a couple other NFT marketplaces. Just kind of trying to explain like what was going on and, and how he built it, you know, at the code level. And one of the most interesting things about it was, you know, despite the foundation of all of that stuff being on blockchain, what ends up happening in practice is that you get a pretty traditional centralized client server approach where there's a couple like large companies that aggregate most of the data in the space. You connect to their APIs um, and just talk back and forth between that centralized entity. And that's like, that's like your blockchain app. And so it hasn't really, it hasn't really achieved like a true decentralization. And to a certain extent, it's tough to say whether it ever will, right? Because that to a certain extent, like in order to pass data efficiently on the web at the scale that it's at today, and this has been true for probably like two or more decades at this point, you kind of need like central entities acting as a backbone and kind of that like hub and spoke model, Um, clients talking to servers and servers talking back. So, but But I definitely think the idea of using a blockchain as um, a ground truth, immutable record for things happening and insert things like that's anything like a transaction, like a piece of art, um, whatever you want to put on there. That's I do think that's that's always going to be the fundamental breakthrough, whether or not we have like fully decentralized. Like, I don't think that's. I don't think that's totally possible, or at least not the way that it's being talked about today. But moving away from central entities as a record keeping source, I think that's the true breakthrough. And you're only going to see more and more applications that leverage that going forward. Yeah, I mean, I I think I've mentioned this maybe on the podcast before, but I am a strong believer that pretty much what you just said is going to be the future. There's not going to be a decentralized world that we live in. It's just not possible. It's Mm -hmm. going to be essentially web two on top of web three rails, just like, just like HTTP. Nobody knows what that is, but we use it every day. That's how you transfer information on the internet. That I think web three will be the new HTTP in the sense that everything that we use on the internet will at some point, I think in probably the next five to 10 years run on a blockchain ledger. And Mm -hmm. whether that's, you know, uh, a layer one or layer two protocol, whatever. But I think most people won't even realize that they're interacting with it. It's just the way it is because it's Mm -hmm. part of it's decentralized. You can't have, you know, a government control or a centralized entity control the the core data, but 
it makes things a lot more efficient and people can put apps on top of it. What do you think mm -hmm. about that? <laughs> yeah, I think one of the most, you know, I think I overall, like I, I vibe with that. And I think if, if you think, if you're talking specifically about like the record keeping piece, you know, one of the things that I do think is like, I mean, so many people have tried to make use cases work for this, but like, think about like a more complex transaction, like a real estate transaction, something like that where there's a ton of legal documentation that then has to get like filed with your local government, like say like a, a deed of trust, if you want to like invest mm. in property or something like that, that, that process current state is like, such a pain in the ass. And yeah. you're trusting that that piece of paper that you get recorded with your county recorder is going to stay in their system. And then when you need it in case of like, you got to defend that in a traditional court, that that document's going to be there. Like that's come on. We could definitely do better than that. We could <laughs> definitely do better than that. That's a great use of, of a distributed ledger and other totally. situations where there's like really sensitive information that people are incentivized to tamper with. And even I think to the point of like the fundamental banking system, like it'll be interesting to see how far that gets penetrated by, by a distributed ledger in general. Cause like banking, the way the banking runs is, um, from like an electronic records and like data transfer standpoint, it's pretty archaic at this point. Mm -hmm. And it's stayed that way because it's such a sensitive piece of infrastructure. Yeah. Um, and so Everyone's people don't touch it. to change it. Yeah. Yeah. People yeah. are super afraid to change it. And that's another area where um, blockchain um, could really make a breakthrough. And I think so. I feel like those are that smart contracts arena and just banking in general, two really interesting areas to watch. Well, I love the real estate example. I mean, to, to throw another layer on, layer on top of that as well. Um, in the past, I've had to file a quick claim deed, basically transferring ownership from myself to an LLC that I had owned. Yeah. And the process of that, it was contacting title, having them provide the quick claim deed for me, signing it, taking it down to uh, the assessor's office, scanning it through their kiosk, talking to somebody on the phone through the kiosk and it was approved right through there. Um, yeah. I think, I, I believe I had to, had, it no, had to have it notarized as well too, but right. think of how that is not it's safe. Crazy. That is not secure. You're, you're, you're ultimately, there's so much trust that has yeah. to go into making sure that individual individuals is, is, is actually gone through a legitimate notary and is going into it with, um, you know, appropriate morals and ethics. So it's, it's scary. I, that I, I really gave that's a, in my head, that's Absolutely. probably, that's a perfect use case for it. So mm -hmm. and that's, that's that kind one. of more your thing than my thing. Like you would know way more about this than I would, but I feel like, especially <laughs> in that real estate space or any, pretty much anywhere where there's like, in order to transfer something from one person to another person or just claim ownership over it, there's a huge like set of documentation, legal documentation that has to be filed in the right way with the right entity is kind of pass through certain people's hands, any, pretty much any use case like that, that's, that, that's right for disruption um, with some type of decentralized tech. Yeah. I'm buying so, a house so, right now and I signed a title today and it was 25 minutes of signing documents and you hope they're yep. operating in, in good faith. And I, I don't have a worry about them not doing that, but it's, yeah, it's right. scary. As they say, Bitcoin fixes that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pomp does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shout out, Pomp. Uh, so outside of work life, what sorts of hobbies and things do you enjoy doing? Yeah, that's a, it's a funny question because I feel like I don't have life outside of work life. Um, <laughs> that's why we asked. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I don't. I've been trying to, um, I, I like to, I like to make music and, and digital art at home. And so do we have I a, put a that... budding NFT artist on our hands? Dude, I would love to make some NFTs. Yeah, that would be that'd be a, that'd be another great way to get kind of more immersed into into some like emerging Web3 stuff. Um, it's a great time to do digital art. And so I honestly, if I could, if I could find the time to make it happen, I probably would. So we'll we'll see with that. I'd love to I'd love to do it. I can't wait to have you on as uh, your first NFT collection is released. We'll have to reserve a few mintings for us just as an FYI. But uh, that that's going to be an exciting new future. So the last question to wrap this up, and then we'll let you get home to the uh, to the kids. How, how old's your How old's your youngest? 
my son just turned two last month. All right. So that's, that's the only other, like, that's what takes up the rest of my time now. So <laughs> how many do you have? Just one. Okay. okay. For some reason I was thinking too, sorry about that. My, yeah. my daughter turned one a few days ago. Nice. Yeah. It's uh, Congrats, amazing. Man. Thanks. You too. It's an amazing experience. So we're going to bring Chris on board in, in no time. <laughs> we're we're still working on the ring and yeah, uh yeah. as soon as the ring happens <laughs> then we will we will work on the next step so hey hey anna how's it going um anywho so the way we like to wrap this off gabe is the name of the, of the podcast is mind the growth and we would love to understand what the word growth means to you whether you can relate it back to business you can relate it to engineering you can relate it to family art whatever what whatever you think of first when you hear the word growth. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like growth to me, I mean, it could be in so many different things, obviously, like you mentioned, but the part that really resonates with me and that I've been thinking about a lot over the last like couple of years going through so many different, um, you know, business situations and, and personal situations and stuff like that. It's probably like, um, yeah, I feel like I've grown when I am able to look back on situations that I went through and be able to understand the the context and reinterpret the facts what happened in a more accurate way like i've achieved like a new level of understanding and even though it's kind of painful like you're like man dude i was an idiot like i was such a naive naive guy at the same time like that that's also where you feel like you've achieved the most growth it's in that like internal understanding of just how stuff works in general i love that i i I'll use a, a a dumbed down version of that. When I was younger, I I would love having the ability to pick up certain books I read, whether it was as a kid or as a younger adult, and reread it and take so many different other lessons out of it based on my experiences, my understanding at that point in life. I I think that's a fantastic explanation. I love it. Well, Gabe, thanks for joining us, man. This is awesome. We really appreciate your time. And we're obviously looking forward to, to hearing how the, the journey is going. We want to keep keep up to date on Outbleak and uh, hopefully your your NFT drop here shortly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll keep you guys in the loop. All right. Thanks, absolutely. man. Yep. Take care, guys. Thanks.